these charming people. These charming people, being a tapestry of the fortunes, follies, adventures, galanteries, and general activities of Sheldon Murdin, thus lovely lady, Lord Terleon, Mr. Michael Wogstaff, Mr. Ralph Windham Trevor, and some others of their friends of the lighter sort. Written down by Mr. Ralph Windham Trevor and narrated by Michael Arlen, author of Piracy. Copyright 1923. That's all. Contents Introducing a lady of no importance and a gentleman of even less. When the Nightingale sang in Berkeley Square. The hunter after wild beasts, the man with the broken nose, the lack of Captain Fortune, the ancient sin, the cavalier of the streets, Major Cypress goes off the deep end, Consuelo Brown, the irreproachable conduct of a gentleman who once refused a knighthood, salute the cavalier, the shameless behavior of a lord, the Quasius, Lady of Lansdowne Passage, The Smell in the Library, The Real Reason Why Selmerdin Was Late for Dinner. I have questions for most of these titles, but we're just gonna read when the Nightingale sang in Berkeley Square. So that's page 15. There we go. When the Nightingale sang in Berkeley Square. There is a tale that is told in London about the Nightingale. How it did this and that, and finally, for no apparent reason, rested and sang in Berkeley Square. A well known poet, critic, and commentator heard it, and it is further alleged that he was sober. Some men, of course, now say that it was not a Nightingale at all but only the south wind singing in the trees of the square, but it is a fact that some men will say anything. And some men have formed a St. James Square school of thought, but it was in Berkeley Square that the poet, critic and commentator who was sober distinctly heard the song of the Nightingale on a night in the heart of the drought of the year 1921. In the drawing room of a house midway of the entailed side of the square sat the lady and the gentleman silently. Or rather, the lady lay while the gentleman sat, and the sofa on which she lay was far from the armchair in which he sat. The room was spacious. Four shaded candles in tall candlesticks of ancient brass gave calm color to its dimness and four open windows, from which the curtains were withdrawn in slack folds of shining si silver, gave out to the leaves of the trees, which murmured among themselves just a little. At last the gentleman roused himself from the gloom of his chair in the recess of the room, and threw back his head and stretched his arms so that little things cracked behind his shoulders. But the lady did not stir nor look round at him. She lay still on the sofa by the windows, her head deep in the hollow of her crimson cushion, her eyes thoughtfully on the ceiling, which was high enough to refuse itself to exact scrutiny in the affected light of four candles. The gentleman drew a cigar case from his breast pocket and a cigar from the case. He bit the cigar and then he moved to deposit what he had bitten from the tip of his finger into an ashtray. Then he lit his cigar thoughtfully, and he said, Hell, it's hot. Perhaps, dear, it's a rehearsal for shame, said the lady. I shouldn't wonder, he said, and stood with his back up to the great Adam fireplace and smoked his cigar. He was of medium height, weather looking, and broadly set, getting a little stout lady, and his fair hair thinning at the top. A commonplace face, you might call it, but the nose was good, straight, short, and sensitive, very English. 
This was Ralph Loyalty, whose aunt, the late John Loyalty, had delighted our fathers with her books, which were of the sentimental, sophisticated sort and have now dated a good deal. Ralph Loyalty was more than usually happy in his aunt, for she had left him a fortune, a famous name, but people said only the more solid side of her good sense. She was a man who liked the company of men. His recreations were golf, joining clubs, auction bridge, and dining with his wife. He enjoyed Georgie Robbie and he admired other people's brains. Some people thought him rather solid and unimaginative, estimate qualities, they said, but rather heavy on the hand. But as Ralph in half a dozen clubs meant Ralph loyalty, other people said that popularity was his form of genius. And they were probably right. He was said to be in love with his wife. He tolerated rakes, cats, and correspondence among his acquaintances. But he never understood them. Effeminate men he laughed at rather shyly, and left it at that. He had no enemies, but most of his wife's friends disliked him. They would have been surprised to see him at this moment, so miserable he looked. But they would not have been surprised at his wife's attitude on the sofa, for naturally she was bored to death with a man. His wife's friends had long since despaired of wrath or loyalty ever seen that his wife was bored to death with him, and that is why they would have been surprised to see him now, for it was obviously because he had realized that this evening, at last, that he looked so miserable. Well, began rough loyalty suddenly, and then very deliberately knocked the ass of his cigar into the fireplace, which was unlike him, with an astray at hand, for he was an older man. And then he said a wicked word and banged out of the room. The candles flickered madly in the sudden draught. But it was as though Miss Loyalty did not hear the crash of the door. She did not stir. She did not sigh, nor did she instantly light the match for the cigarette which had lain for many minutes forgotten near her hand. Joan Loyalty was dark, or rather, her hair was dark, and darker than ever against the crimson cushion. But her face was fair, English fair, and many generations had gone to the establishing of her complexion and the exact shaping of her delicate aquiline nose. But it was her eyes that were important, to the student of such things. Joan Loyalty belonged to the society of the day, and of that society her face, the oval sort, was, her friend said in their loose way, in the best way, typical. She was of the type early 20th century, but her gestures, and lack of them, were ancient enough, for they were fully expressive of that which really differentiates men from beasts, the social quality of being tired. But, beneath that manner, that classical insolence which is in inadequately called affectation, lay a John who was as sudden and as simple as the first woman. And that is why her eyes were important to the student of such things, for in them was that thing which defies the analyzing of novelists and demagogues. The thoughtful look which may only be thinking of a walk in a field with a dog and a stick. The curious, absent look which can smell the sea from a long way off. At last, Miss Loyalty lit her cigarette and she rose from the sofa, and for a few minutes she listened to the murmuring of the leaves in the square, and then she crossed the dimness of the room to a bell button and pressed it. Smith came and she said, Downstairs in the study you will find a book, probably on the small table by the window, a slim blue book by a Mr. Beerbohm. Please bring it to me. The shadow of Smith hovered doubtfully among the shadows by the door. Mr. Loyalty is in the study, madam, and told me he was not to be disturbed. Ah, said Miss Loyalty softly, and she smiled, and when she smiled, you understood why dogs liked her at once. All right, Smith, she said, I will fetch it myself. The shadow of Smith vanished in a flickering of candles, but Miss Loyalty did not follow him at once. 
She stood where rough loyalty had stood, with her back to the great Adam fireplace. In a gesture of tired thought, she clasped her hands behind her head, and from the motionless cigarette between her lips, the smoke floated upwards without a curve until it faded, for she was forgetting to draw it. Then suddenly, she dropped the half smoked cigarette into the empty grate and untied the habit of hers, which her husband could not ever quite overlook, and left the room. The quality of silence was very noticeable about the figure of Miss Loyalty. It had been favorably commented on by distinguished foreigners who say that though foreign women are noisy talkers, English women are noisy voters, which, however, sounds like a generalization and should be mistrusted as such. But silence was, in a particular way, a quality of Miss Loyalty's figure, just like its slimness. And when a few minutes later she re-entered the room with her book in her hand, it was almost as though she had not re-entered the room or had never left it. Perhaps a shadow faintly stirred among the shadows by the door, but the draft of her coming in did not seem to disturb the sensitive light of the candles. She moved one of them to the little table at the head of the sofa. She sat against the crimson cushion, and she read her book. That means fast, and she did not turn over the page, so perhaps she was just pretending to read. Minutes passed, and then the light of the candles right across her page. And she looked up to see a great disturbance among the shadows by the door. She stared with very wide eyes at the dark apparition there, and her hand went to her heart in a still way she had, and she sighed curiously. The apparition came forward, and she stared at it with almost unbelieving eyes. Joan, the apparition said, I never thought I should live to see you look frightened. A gay voice, rather shy. He stood before her, a tall, very thin man, stooping a little, with feverish dark eyes set in a notably ascetic face, which had gained for him the comical name of the Metaphysician. His face was as though a fever lay behind it, a kind of somber restlessness, but every now and then it would twitch into a shy smile. His face looked as though it had suffered much pain, but had never got used to pain. He smiled down at her in intimately, but also shyly, which made the smile very attractive. Well, she said up to him softly, you did come in rather like a ghost, didn't you? She seemed to examine him. Didn't Ralph tell you I was coming? That seemed to surprise her, but she only shook her head slightly. I saw Ralph at the club this evening and told him I might look in, he added. He didn't tell me, she said, but why didn't you let me know? You see, John, said Hugo Carr. I've had as much as I can bear of this whole on corner business. A shy way Mr. Carr had, he would say firm things in a very shy voice, with a fever always behind his face. That's what makes him attractive to women, people said. Hugo lays down the law, once said George Terleon, as though he were laying eggs and was afraid they might break. He sat down on the sofa beside her, very close on the edge of the sofa, sideways to her, with one knee almost on the ground. She lit a cigarette and, seeing the appeal on his face, she smiled a little, her lips smiled, and she said so. Forgive me, dear, but I feel very sad. The heat, perhaps, but go on with your speech, please do and I'm hoping too that it will contain some inside information as to why you have not been to see me or even rang me up for a week. It's such bad luck for a woman, she said softly, when a man of honor remembers his honor. Don't you think so, Hugo? Her eyes looked as though she had left them on guard somewhere, watching something for her, but he didn't notice that. He was one of those feverish men who never notice anything but other people's feverishness, at which they feel aggrieved. See, John, he began nervously, you and I have been living a life for two years. There's no getting out of it for two whole years. We've dragged ourselves and each other, we're saying we couldn't help it. 
You have, she murmured. I don't need drugs. Yes, I have, he agreed quickly. And you have let me, because there was nothing we could do, so we said. And suddenly he broke off and put his hand on her neck. Do you love me, Joan? Yes, she said. No more for John's love was never expressed in words. She was not like that. But it was his particular effeminacy to be intensely pleased to hear her say she loved him. He would grow, he, he would glow the profundish. One of the two people in love must be effeminate, after all. That's been my one excuse, he said shy. And it's my justification now for what I must do. That we've loved each other for two years and still love each other. I'm going to ask Ralph tonight to give you your freedom. So that's why you haven't been to see me for a week. Yes, I want to be free to think. You influence me frightfully, John. You are stronger than I am, and so if I was to think that our way out of this model, I had to do it alone. Ralph was my best friend, and for two years you and I have been meeting each other secretly, for lunch and for the afternoons, and at home you've been living this life with Ralph. You've sort of crucified yourself, John, because you didn't want to hurt Ralph. And I've let you. It's ghastly. And Ralph has always tried to sit us together. He's made it easy for us. It's ghastly, John. Yes, it's ghastly, she murmured from her heart. John, her lover whispered, in the secret book in which our lives are being written, you will appear as an angel and die as a cat. For that is how it has been for two years, and Hugo Carr, of the somber eyes and the thin face that looked as though a fever lay behind it, passed a hand across his eyes, and her arm crept up around his shoulder, and she held his face very near. Poor darling, she whispered. You've suffered frightfully, haven't you? And she did little things to comfort him. But you've suffered much more, he whispered, into her hair. He kissed her hair, and I've let you go on not hurting Ralph. And what good has it done? Ralph suspects me. I know he does, it's difficult to explain. But it will be alright now, John showed his wretchedness. He turned her face to him and looked into her eyes, the grave eyes that looked as though she had left them on guard somewhere, watching something for him. So do you agree with me now, John? He whispered gladly, but she seemed to answer irrelevantly with a peculiar little laugh she had, which stabbed his heart with a pleasure that was almost pain. To agree or to disagree, what does it matter to me, Hugo? Only you matter, sitting here, and I only matter because I am beside you. So let's be silent a little while, thinking of each other. And she turned very wretched eyes on him. Do you realize, Hugo, that you and I have scarcely had a minute of silence together for two years? You and I, whose lives are, are spent in chattering, have had to go on chattering even when we were alone. We could never forget ourselves or Ralph. We had always to be discussing what we would do and how we would do it, and when we would do it. Discussing and discussing and discussing. Oh dear, our love has been one endless discussion. And we are not very young anymore, was it? But now we will be just silent, thinking of nothing but each other for the first time in two years. We won't think of Ralph, my dear. We just want to please me, Hugo. It was an unusual pleasure for him to see her so soft. She was so essentially fine that her natural softness had been merged into a great calmness, a delicious thing in a woman. Calmness but rather frightening. But this was a matter of honor tonight. He had betrayed his best friend for two years and would not betray him any longer. It had come to a point of honor that he must tell Ralph loyalty that he loved John. And so now, even as he thrilled at her sweetness, he would have liked to say to her that his business tonight was with a point of honor, but he was much too self-conscious to be dramatic. He smiled self-consciously and only said, But I must see Ralph tonight, dear. When I came in, I told Smith, Oh, she cut impatiently in, Be silent, Hugo. 
Be silent, let's enjoy ourselves while we may. Nerves, of course, as herself admitted immediately by asking quite differently. What did you say you told Smith? Didn't he just tell you I was up here alone? Yes, but I asked where Ralph was and he said in the study, and so I told him to tell Ralph in an hour's time that I was here. He said Ralph had given orders not to be disturbed, but I told him he expected me, and so I suppose he'll be here soon. Ah, said John. God, it will be difficult, Hugo muttered. Dear old Ralph, the simplest man there ever was. What an unholy mess life is, John, that you and I have to fight our way to happiness over Ralph's body, just because you met him before you met me. Don't say that, she cried sharply. Nerves. She smiled away his bewilderment. What I really meant was, don't say anything, or if you told Smith to tell him in an hour's time, we've still half an hour or so together. She held up her wrist to the candlelight. Yes, just about that. And then there will be quite enough talking and discussing. And I've got something important to tell you too, before he comes in. But dear, I must enjoy just a little peace before the storm that will set me free. My first bit of peace in two years. She pleaded with him, and it was delicious to hear John pleading. She, who usually was so calm and sensible. And so they sat very close, hand in hand, like children. But Smith's idea of an hour was influenced by a non unnatural desire to go to bed, and they had not enjoyed their peace for more than five minutes, when it was tremendously shattered by footfalls on the stairs. Oh lord, muttered Hugo Carr, but rather comically, for after all it had to be got over sometime. John went queerly taut and began to say something very swiftly, but the door opened just then and he did not catch what it was. Entered Smith, only Smith, and Hugo Carr breathed relief that his point of honor had not yet grown upon him. John made no sign. Smith came forward quickly, the candles flickered uneasily across his face. He addressed Hugo Carr. Sir, he said quickly, I went in to announce you to Mr. Loyalty. He broke off and his eyes hovered over John. Yes, Smith, she encouraged him softly. Smith's eyes still hovered about him. He seemed very perturbed. He addressed the air between them. Mr. Loyalty's dead, said Smith. Smith was not a heartless man. He was moved and plunged again into the startled silence. I went in and found him with his head laid across the writing table and a little bottle empty by his hand. I shook him. My God, muttered Hugo Carr. But still his eyes were fixed on Smith. He could not look at John. An analysis of suicide was not among Smith's duties. He only added, I have telephoned to Dr. Gay, madam, and as he was out playing bridge, I asked Miss Gay to ring him up to come here, as it was very urgent. Why, Smith? What could be more non-committal than very urgent for suicide? My God, Mother Hugo Carr, and jumped up and strode away to the fireplace. He had not yet looked at John. But Smith looked at her and she back at him. Smith was a nice man and he respected his mistress immensely. You're kind. I'm very sorry indeed, madam, said Smith. John's lips scarcely moved. Thank you, Smith. Smith went out softly. I never dreamed, Hugo Carr burst out, then shocked. It was as though he had swept his arm around to ward off an intolerable thing and had found the thing too intolerable. John went to him. Hugo, she awoke him softly, and he looked at her for the first time since Smith's entrance. His eyes clung to her. A very fond gesture took her hand to his hold. The tall, thin, stooping man, whose white face took a word as visibly as its suffered a headache. Hugo Carr found many things quite unbearable. His eyes seemed to cling to her for a support against his thoughts. It's ghastly, he whispered. 
John, don't you see? It's ghastly. Poor old laugh down there all alone. Why are we up here? He passed a hand over his mouth to stop it twitching. And it was as though his hand had put on it a bitterness which was not there before. While we up here, we are making love, his best friend and his wife. Involuntarily, he put his best friend first. For Hugo Carr loved his friends. And for him, friendship was one of the first principles of the civilized state. That is how he saw the civilized state. Poor, poor La Ralph, she said ever so softly. His eyes tore away from her face, as though they hadn't been able to find there the support they needed. There are some things, he began feverishly. Oh, my dear, John protested miserably, as though against the unbearable philosophy of it. But it is a mistake to protest against the unbearable philosophy of a man of honor. There are some things, Mr. Carr insisted, with feverish violence, that are unpardonable and unmedable, and there is no excuse big enough for them. He looked like a priest, a priest in the temple of Francis, burning incense to the ideal idea, and John nodded, her eyes on him who saw nothing but the ruin of the ideal idea. God simply has not put enough excuses into the world to meet the crimes of the world. The world burst out of him, and this is even worse because it is a crime so big that there is simply no punishment being made to meet it. It's just betrayal. And the force of that medieval word, its ultimate meaning, broke him down. Gugar sobbed. Oh my god, it's beastly, beastly! Poor old Ralph, down in that room, alone, betrayed by his best friend and his wife, and suspecting at last that he had been betrayed, only suspecting it, and not able to bear the suspicion. That's a horrible part of it, don't you see, John? Don't you see? How could he bear it, dear old Ralph, who has never suspected anyone in his life? He simply he wasn't made that way. And so, oh my god, while we were making love up here, we who have quibbled of for two years whether we would hurt his feelings or not, his feelings! We've killed old Ralph. Her eyes were on him, but he saw nothing but the ruin of the ideal idea, and an odd little jerk crept about her mouth. Perhaps it was from an odd little jerk like that, that about the lips of a young princess of olden time that there sprang the many depths of young princesses who loved yet lashed their lovers. It was not contemptuous, it was much too little her for that. It was supremely dignified. Mona Lisa has it, though some say that Mona Lisa smites. If Mary Stuart had seen the portrait of Mona Lisa, she would have whispered. She is thinking that men are but minutes in a woman's life, and she is right. Hugo. But when he looked at her, it was as though he was still looking at words. It is not fair to us to say we've killed him, and it is childish. Life killed him, Hugo. And you are not more sorry than I, who have tried so hard for eight years to make life sweet for him. Oh my god, how I've tried. He thought out loud softly, you are a marvelous woman, John. It's only, she said gently, that I know what is worthwhile to me, and you don't. That must make life very difficult for you. That is all, she said, and Hugo Carr stared at her, bewilderment joining the fever in his eyes. What do you mean, John? He asked miserably, bewildered. Hugo Carr couldn't bear not understanding things. A few yards separated them, and John crossed swiftly to him, and she took his arm and held it very tight. Some people said that John's hands were almost too thin, but what they held, they held very tight. Listen to me, Hugo, for if this mood of yours isn't met now, in this horrible moment, it may ruin our lives. May ruin? But she held his arm tight. Yes, dear, this is ruin, but why won't you face facts? Why won't you face the bridge that life has shaped to frighten us? Why won't you see that this is the culminating point of three ruined lives and that on the ruins of three lives we must now build a city for two? 
It won't be a very fair city, Hugo, but it serves by right. By the only real right in this wrong world. The right of misery. Now the eyes of a man who sees a wraith are more frightening than the wraith that he sees. That is why its own loyalty left her sentence in the air, for it had been snuffed by his stare. But aren't you sorry? He whispered right. And she laughed. Her nerves laughed through her mouth. Sorry. You dare to ask me if I am sorry. Or oh, Hugo, is it absolutely necessary for the love of a man for a woman to be expressed in fatuous questions? Oh God, what kind of thing is this love that it tricks a mind into loving a man? I don't know what you mean, he muttered sulkily. The car couldn't bear not understanding things. You ask me if I am sorry. I, who have lived through a hell of boredom for eight years, so as not to hurt Ralph's feelings, not to break his heart. And now at last it's broken. Yes, I am sorry. Frightfully sorry. And I'm also glad. I feel as though I myself had died and that my soul had been freed from my long imprisonment. That is what I felt as though it was I who was dead when I saw him. He gaped at her idiotically. For heaven's sakes. Don't stare in that idiotic way, Hugo. I've already had more than I can bear tonight. Sitting here and thinking and thinking of poor Ralph downstairs and wondering what final thought it must have been that made him do it. Hugo Carr couldn't understand. But when? How? Had not she warned him that she had already had more than she could bear? And now her nerves rose up to meet his even stare. This is why I looked so frightened when you came in. I didn't expect you. I didn't know who it could be. And I was frightened. And that is why I was relieved when you said you had told Smith to go into the study in an hour's time. Because that would give me time to think, to realize the thing, and to tell you. Didn't I say that I had something important to tell you before? Before Ralph came in? I was going to tell you that Ralph would never come in, for I had seen him when I went downstairs to fetch a book. You were reading when I came in, he accused her queerly. Oh dear, you are like a man out of every book that was ever written by a man about women. I was pretending to read, and then you told me you had come to see Ralph on a point of honor. At last you had summoned up your courage to see Ralph on a point of honor. And that's why I wanted you to be silent for a while. For speech sometimes makes tragedy unbearably idiotic. I wanted peace, Hugo. I wanted just to taste the peace between the old life and the new. The old life in which there was no honor and the new life in which there would anyway be happiness. And she touched him, but with a blind gesture of his arm, he swept her aside and strode out of the room. She stared, wide-eyed, unrealizing at the panels of the door. She took two quick steps towards the door, she stopped, and then she ran madly to it and opened it, and called, Hugo! Hugo! But even as she cried his name, the door below slammed massively, like an L from the bowels of the earth, and through the windows of the room behind her came the noise of swift, footsteps striding away. She went back into the room. Still, she could not realize. She paced about the room here, there, trying to think, trying not to think, wishing to give way to the intolerable moment, unable to give way. The candles danced furiously in a gentle draft, for she had left the door wide open. She was but a shadow among a furious company of shadows. When, as she was by the windows, she saw one more in the open doorway. She screamed behind her teeth. I heard you call his name, said Ralph loyalty, hoarsely from the door. Have you quarreled? Do you mean to say he's gone for good? He came towards her as he spoke. But this was not the Ralph she knew. This was not the Ralph who had lived and died. This was a man with a furious face. He advanced on her. Her knees trembled, and she would have fallen but for a hand on the back of the sofa. 
Do you mean to say he's gone for good? He repeated again furiously. She nodded dumbly. She was going to faint. Then Ralph Royalty said a wicked word. Do you mean to say that I've shown him dead in a damn uncomfortable position for the last two hours? For nothing, he bowled at her. Here have I been for months and months throwing you at each other's heads, and neither of you with a plaque to show your hand. And he cares the name of Hugo Carr for the name of a fool and a coward. She was going to faint. He controlled his, um, himself a little. He appealed to her. I didn't want to hurt your feelings, you see, John. I knew how you'd loved me for years and I couldn't bear to hurt you. But I'd have given anything to let you. See, I wanted my freedom to marry someone else. And when I saw that you liked being with Hugo, I thought there might be a chance of your liking him instead of me. And so I did my best to throw you together. But Hugo always was a coward, and as I couldn't bear going on as we were for another night, I arranged this thing tonight, thinking that if anything, would make Hugo show his hand or would throw you into Hugo's arm this week. And again he said a wicked word. I didn't want to hurt you, you see, John. And so I thought this would be the best way. And now the silly ass has gone and left us stranded. That was the night the nightingale sang in Berkeley Square. A nightingale has never sung in Berkeley Square before, and may never sing there again. But if it does, it will probably mean something. So this is where this short story ends. It is a part of the book This Charming People. I wanted to put the audiobook out there, mainly because it doesn't exist, but also because I'm uploading, uh, or I just uploaded, depends on when they will be published. Uh, when two lovers meet in the song uh, The Night of the Sang in Berkeley Square uh, from Good Omens, sung by Tori Amos. The song was uh, written around 1940, and the songwriters said that the title was taken from this story in particular. And I decided to read the story at some point and saw that there were some things that reminded me of Good Omens. I feel like uh, the authors Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett have actually read this story before writing Good Omens, and perhaps several stories of Michael Arlen. I see a similarity in the way they write and think of connection between different uh, stories and words. Um, I would say that reading the story a second time, perhaps Joan is supposed to be Crowley and uh, Hugo Aziraphale and maybe uh, I forgot the other protagonist's name. The husband, Mr. Loyalty, maybe he's supposed to be God or something? It would be very funny if uh, the characters match like that between Good Omens and uh, this uh, little short story. It's also strange that this uh, uh, label over here, The Dark Angel, a novel by McLarlan, I can't find anything about it on the internet. Maybe it was lost or maybe it was never published, but the Dark Angel does remind me of demons. In any case, I definitely uh, would recommend reading uh, the rest of the stories, they are quite uh, fun. Uh, they have twists like this, again and again. And uh, other stories from Michael Allen actually seem very fun, too. Tragic, as well. This, like I said at the start, is not actually written by him. It's written by Ralph Windham Trevor and it seems to be based on true events or something. I'm not sure about the details. Um, you can find the story in the link that I will attach. Uh, it's on Internet Archive for free, but it has no it has no audio form. So if you can't read the picture, maybe you won't be able to access it. So it's one of the reasons why de I decided to put myself out there and re make it an audiobook, just this one sh story, of course. 
I will probably not repeat in this process. I'm definitely not um, a voice actor. But it was fun. And I hope you like it. And I hope you support the, world, the works of very talented people like this. And if you want to make up theories about what is happening in Good Omens and what's the uh, connection with the story and uh, whatever else you want, I am all ears. I would love to hear them. I will probably not be uploading my own theories. I know there's uh, many people on YouTube who do that and I admire them. Some theories are very, very fun. There's a channel in particular that I'm also going to mention or link uh, in the description that has pretty fun theories and analysis of everything good domains related so that's it for me for this video um makeup theories because it's fun and good domain season 3 isn't going to come out for a long time if it does come out and and have a great day or night or whatever time it is for you. Goodbye.